Thank you. Good morning. Uh, welcome to this last lecture on uh, open quantum systems in their Markovian limits. Um, before I go on, I would just like to say one sentence, which is a summary of yesterday, the part that we did yesterday that we shall use today again, and which is that repeated, non-degenerate, non-demolition measurements are equivalent to von Neumann measurements. This is what we showed yesterday. I, at least I gave some argument about that. And so uh, maybe before I start today's lecture, lecture uh, it's appropriate to check if you have questions. If no questions, then I'll start. So the plan for today is to use uh, non-demolition uh, I'm sorry, non-destructive quantum non-demolition measurements to observe non-trivial systems and in particular to observe quantum jumps. That's the first part. And then if time permits, I will uh, say a few words about quantum noises, which is the quantum uh, version of classical noises. So classical noises like white noise or whatever, well, they have a correspondence, in fact, a very rich uh, correspondence in the quantum case, and I will say just very briefly what, what, what that means. But it will be insufficient for you to work with quantum noises, but at least it will give you a, a flavor of this interesting subject. Okay, so um, I turn to the first part. Um, in fact, precisely, I guess, 100 years ago, or maybe 101 years ago, Bohr wrote one of the first uh, papers uh, on quantum mechanics, which was not quantum mechanics at that time, and he talked about quantum jumps, that you would have, you know, he had this idea, there is nothing quantum in his paper, essentially, apart from the fact that he says, okay, the, the electrons around an atom, they are on uh, orbits, and then some time, from time to time they may jump from one orbit to the other. So he, he really, at that time, people had developed some kind of feeling. I mean, they understood that classical physics was not good to understand atoms. And they had some rules saying, OK, in, in that circumstance, uh, I apply the rules of classical physics, for instance, to uh, uh, compute the, the, the shape of the trajectories, which should be circles. And then at some time, they say, OK, but then classical physics doesn't work. And then we have a few set of rules. And in fact, this is a really wonderful paper uh, hard to understand, but uh, nowadays uh, we understand it a little bit better. And there are allusions to quantum jumps. And in fact, it was a big ba breakthrough when people were able to observe uh, in fluorescen uh, fluorescence of uh, um, atoms and showing that uh, you, know, uh, you, you can see effectively quantum jumps. Uh, you count, you count uh, uh, emitted photons uh, in the an appropriate experiment of uh, fluorescence. And this was the first one, but uh, it's again an experiment that I don't understand very well. And recently, uh, using exactly the techniques that I described yesterday, the people in the same lab and with the same uh, uh, setup were able to uh, look at quantum jumps uh, in a simpler setting that I will explain. And then I will uh, show you a, a few pictures, and then I will show you how to have a model for that uh, in our framework and uh, what it predicts and how it's in agreement or not with the uh, experiment. Okay, so, and I will, yes, I will give a few examples of all that. So we are back again with this uh, setting that we have our experiment with probes and all that. I mean, nothing has, nothing much ch has changed. And however, uh, this time, we are in a situation in which it's hard to consider that uh, this cavity is isolated from the rest of the world. In fact, there is, this is th these experiments that are done at very low temperature, however, there are some uh, thermal excitations, and so it may happen that due to interactions with the environment, the number of photons in the cavity jumps, and they made this experiment in a very special uh, situation in which the temperature is so low that, in fact, essentially you can concentrate on the case when you have exactly zero or one photon inside the cavity, no more. 
So you have one photon inside the cavity or zero, you don't know. And sometimes uh, due to interactions with the environment, the physical picture we have is that one photon is absorbed or created uh, by uh, the environment. And whatever happens with this environment, on top of that, we add our Rydberg atoms that come into the cavity and probe the number of photons inside. So if there were no uh, fluctuations due to uh, uh, thermal excitations, we would just do like yesterday. After a while, doing the measurements on the Rydberg atom, we would know if there is zero or one photon inside the cavity. Now, from time to time, a photon can be created or absorbed. And so here is uh, typically the kind of things these people found. Uh, it's, uh, the paper is entitled uh, Quantum Jumps of Light Recording Birth and Death of a Photon in a Cavity. Here is the reference for interested people. And uh, what is it? They, what they do is exactly what we did yesterday. So they look at basically a few uh, Rydberg atoms and look if they, is, which is not enough to have really uh, the full collapse. And they say, okay, let's see whether or not these, th the measurements are on, let's say, these 10 atoms tell us that we are probably with zero or with one photon. Because, you know, the, the wave function has started to collapse. So 10, ten uh, uh, photons is already an indication. 10, sorry, Rydberg atoms is already an indication. And so let's look whether or not. Uh, we are the, the 10 photons tell us we, ha we are uh, in, th in the zero or one photon case. And if it's, uh, I so if it's in the one photon, zero photon state, you're uh, down. If it's in the one photon state, you're up. And if you look at the experiment, you start and most of the time, you well, you see there are some tiny things here, but most of the time you see that you are blue. So the answer of the measurement is telling you that there is only, uh, there, is, there is no photon in the cavity. And then suddenly, the counting of uh, Rydberg atoms and the, the experiment's results tell you that, in fact, something has happened. And in fact, there are much, much more uh, cases when you find see one photon than zero photon with this imperfect measurement. And so this is exactly an observation that at this time, basically, an excitation has been created inside the cavity and now there is one photon and this photon lives for a certain time and after a while it decays into the vacuum again, again due to thermal perturbations. And here is what you see that uh, you count uh, that you are in the zero photon case. And of course you can do a, it's maybe more spectacular. I mean, here you could say, okay, here I find many, many times that there is one photon inside the cavity, but if you just enlarge the picture, you will see that indeed this is really much, uh, much more populated than the, uh, uh, this case here. I mean, you see, really, there is something quite sharp happening here. This situation is really different from that one. I mean, this is mo even more evident on this picture than on this one. Okay, so that's the experiment. And uh, the goal of uh, today's uh, lecture is to explain a little bit uh, what's the theory of such experiments and, and what uh, theory predicts. And in fact, theory predicts quite interesting things. Um, so uh, I will start with defining for you what are called quantum trajectories. This is the first. Okay, so basically this is just a name, a quantum trajectory, it's just the uh, time evolution of a density matrix. Subject to an evolution Such, such as, well, what I told you the other days, the, the, the limiting case where you just don't have any randomness, so you have just a, a rho n, a, a dag, or the more complicated one, you have measurements and you have this formula that this is 
aa rho n aa dag divided by trace of blah 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 with probability Okay, so we have such a dynamics, either deterministic or random, iter iterative, and the succession of values of rho is called the quantum trajectory. And this is, so somehow this is uh, s some kind of classical object. I mean, it's, it's at the same time quantum and classical. I mean. So you can plot, you can plot uh, the evolution of rho and then call this a quantum trajectory. You'd, we, quantum trajectories are not trajectories of particles, they are trajectories in the space of density matrices. Okay, so now our goal uh, today, in fact, is the following. We shall imagine that we have a density matrix that evolves in principle according, let's say, to such a law. And we would like to observe the system with non-demolition measurements. So what does that mean? I mean, there are, if you think for a while, uh, so goal is sort of quantum trajectories via non-degenerate quantum non-demolition measurements. And how is this done? Well, I have, uh, of course, I will change a bit uh, my uh, the, the names, but imagine that I have BB or uh, operators for quantum non-demolition measurements. Okay, so which means, as usual, I mean, sum over B, BB dag BB is equal to 1 hs, as usual, I sum over b, and uh, what is it? Yes, okay, well, that's the only thing, and, and the bb, well, and the b th there is a pointer state basis, in which all the bbs are diagonal. Okay, so how are we going to use these guys? Well, in fact, I will use a very simple fact which doesn't de in fact depend on the fact that those guys are or are not uh, non-demolition. I will use a very basic fact, very stupid, which is that, in fact, there are the, the equations we wrote down have nice composition properties and now I claim that if I consider the operators, I will imagine that A belongs to a certain uh, index set, which is this. This one belongs to another uh, set. And then if I call C is AB, it belongs to uh, uh, I times J. And if I define the operator CC to be equal to BBAA, okay. Then I claim that the CCs have the same the same property that sum of CC dag CC is equal to the identity on HS. Okay. So what we we replace this equation? In fact, if so, well, so this means that if you if your system if so star for instance is going to describe in, in the experiment that I showed you, star is going to describe, let's say, thermalization. And we are going to observe this thermalization by submitting the system to a non-demolition measurement. And, and the way we do that is to replace the operators just A by the operators C here. So which means that now I go to rho n plus 1 equals uh yes okay well this is this is going to be a bit fain painful but th that's not a problem it's going to be b b sum over a a a 
rho n a a dag b b dag divided by trace b b sum over a a a rho n a a dag b b dag with probability which is exactly given by this denominator okay so what does that mean that means that instead of in okay the I, i'm cheating a little bit but uh, it, it's just i'm just cheating in the way i'm counting time in fact instead of having this just this evolution during a one time step let me imagine for instance which is physically reasonable that the time it takes to make the probe measurement is very very small with respect to the time uh, step you have here so then if you in the, you can do in a time step you can at the same time have this evolution and then make one non demolition measurement so after one unit of time essentially this is exactly what you are going to get hmm? okay so these are the basic equations that uh, we are willing to use today and we are going to iterate them and see what it gives and so what i claim is that essentially this is for instance a good model for the experiment that i showed you so you make one time step to thermalize and then in essentially zero time you make one measurement and one done demolition measurement and then again you have one time step to thermalize and you can make one done demolition measurement and you uh, iterate okay so in a sense if you want now the environment somehow is becoming much larger than it was before i mean in the experiment i described yesterday the environment the role of the environment was played by the uh uh, uh Rydberg atoms now if you don't put Rydberg atoms but there are some thermal excitations in fact the environment for the cavity is going to be a thermal bath and now i'm going to play with a large environment which consists at the same time of thermal excitations and probe measurements okay so this is this is it and the a is describe the interaction with the uh, thermal uh, environment and the b is describe the interactions uh, due to the probes and the trick i'm playing here for instance let's okay let maybe that's totally unclear for you but imagine that you would like to compute the uh, evolution you imagine you have uh, a hamiltonian which is let's say kinetic energy plus potential energy okay and you want it to, you want to compute e to the i t uh, h well there is one way there are several ways to do that but there is one way you can play with which is simple which is to say that in fact this u of t this is this is going to be a limit and epsilon goes to z to zero let's say let's say n goes to infinity and you take e to the e t over n k e to the e t over n v and you take it to the power n and you yes and you take the limit and going to infinity you see you have this of course uh, this kinetic energy plus potential energy they act the, at the same time on the system however there is a nice limit in which we can decide that you let act for a very tiny time just the kinetic energy then just the uh, potential energy and you do that many times and in the end you get exactly the same result this is basically you could tell me okay uh, it's this is just crazy i mean during the during the time the probe passes through the system the interactions with the thermal bus continue and all that and you are perfectly right however uh, for reasons which are analogous to this little limiting theorem which is called the trotter formula or something like that you can you have you can also say okay let's say that i can decompose that there is part of the time in which there is only the thermal piece part of the time in which there is only the interaction with the probes as soon as we are interested in the large end behavior and the time scales are small uh, this is just equivalent just in in just the same way as this formula is the correct formula for the evolution 
Okay. Um, and of course, this wouldn't this this isn't right as long as n is finite. This is this, this formula is not correct. It's, it's only correct in the asymptotics. But that's basically the logic that's at work. That instead of putting together uh, the the both environments, we let them act one after the other in a repeated way, and this is equivalent uh, asymptotically. Okay. So. Um, I would now let, uh, try to give some kind of explicit example of what is going on here. So I should forget. I get. I guess I will erase that. So. Uh, so first of all, so what we have to do, if I want to do, so we want to model the thermal evolution. Okay, so now I will show you a little trick. I will show you how to construct solutions of uh, the equations we like. And uh, it's, uh, well, it's worth what it's worth. So suppose that you have a good description of a classical system going to equilibrium. Via a Markov chain. That means you have a Markov matrix M alpha beta. So wh why does it ma what do why do I call a Markov matrix? I just have M alpha beta larger than uh, equal to zero for each alpha beta, and M alpha beta, I guess, summed over alpha is equal to 1, and this is just chosen to guarantee, so I should make sure that I'm correct with, uh, yes, that's correct, that if I define q n plus 1 of alpha is equal to sum over beta m alpha beta q n of beta, then this conserves probability. Is probability conserving? So this is a Markov chain. This is the probability to be in Qn of beta is the probability to be in state beta at time n. And then to let it evolve in time, I use, I use this equation. And so suppose that you are very happy that, and, and then of course when you iterate, you may reach a certain uh, uh, equilibrium. And now if, uh, if at large n, suppose at large n, Qn of alpha behaves like e to the minus e alpha over kt. E, these are the energy levels. So you see, uh, this is just uh, uh, okay. So this is just the Boltzmann equilibrium. So imagine you are very happy. That with for a classical uh, system, uh, you have this uh, Markov chain that does a good job for you. You are happy with it. Then I claim that there is one way, trivial way, to make also a quantum uh, uh, evolution out of that. And I claim the following. I will take as uh, uh, the set of... so I. Now, if I want to do the quantum case, I have to find some set of A's, and I will say that if alpha belongs to some index set, uh, let's say, uh, how can I call it, 
I should forget about these notations here. So let's, let's say alpha belongs to i. This is not the same i as before. And then I will decide that a will belong to a square. Okay. And I will define the following matrix a a. By definition, this is just going to be delta a alpha and its index alpha beta, delta a i alpha, delta j beta, m alpha beta, I'm sorry for the noise, to the one half. And just if a is equal to i j belonging to i squared. Okay, so I imagine that the set of states varies in a certain index set here. I take the square of it and I take one measurement operator for each pair of states. Okay, I say take one IA. Then I, I claim, and I let you check this, that first of all, sum over A, AA dagger AA is equal to the identity on HS. And then if you compute things, I mean, this is a little bit uh, uh, trivial, I mean, tautological, you will find quite easily that sum over A, 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 row, A, A, dag, this is something which is very tough. This is just going to be M applied to the diag diagonal of row. The diagonal matrix, I'm sorry, yes, maybe I should say this. It's the diagonal made of M applied to the diagonal of row. You see, I take the diagonal elements. So to say things uh, differently, maybe the, the best way to say it, that this is just this. Okay, so maybe I can say this may a little bit less abstractly. If I take sum over A, 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 row, a, A, dag, alpha, beta. This is just going to be delta alpha, beta. So I find a diagonal matrix at the end. And this is, and here I find just sum over, uh, so I should, I should make it uh, correctly, sum over gamma of M alpha, gamma, rho, gamma, gamma. Okay, this is, this is the rule. Okay, so th th this is a, a trivial computation. I mean, you take these operators, check this for you, and then check wh how it acts. And so what, what, what is this evolution? I have a density matrix row, which is full of elements. And what does it become? I put zeros downstairs, zeros upstairs, and something which is... Uh, and I only have something on the diagonal, okay? So uh, this is, of course, not... Uh, you may think this is a, a very, very bad uh, physical choice for the... Uh, uh, to have something so brutal that if you start with a density matrix, just at the next time step, you've just completely killed all the non-diagonal elements. So it's unphysical, but uh, nevertheless... Uh, um, a little bit physical. The idea is the following, that in many, many systems, decoherence, which means that starting from a pure state, you end up in a state which is not pure, but a statistical uh, mixture, is very, very fast with respect to the other relaxations. And this is exactly what this tells you. It, it, this is just uh, saying, okay, uh, one time step is, is l much, much larger than the decoherence uh, time in the system, and so even if I have something which is strongly uh, uh, a pure state or whatever, um, then after just after one time step, decoherence has taken place, and we just see a statistical mixture. So this is brutal, but uh, it's sometimes justified. So and then once you have this, you can interpret what these objects are. The, you see, this this is the action on the of the environment of the system, and this is telling you that. Each of the uh, of these uh, actions is in fact creating a transition. If you take the operator a corresponding to i j, well, then this transition is just something that allows a transition between the states alpha and beta. 
That's exactly what, or in fact, between the states i and j. So each a i j is just triggering one transition of the system from one state to another. This is a semi-classical picture. It's triggering a transition from one state alpha to a state uh, beta. Okay, so now we can, so now it's, it's fine. We are uh, in a situation where if we know a classical description of uh, approach to equilibrium, then we also know a quantum one, which is a bit brutal because it destroys all coherence in one time step, but it's better than nothing. If you are unhappy with this procedure, you can f try to find a better one, and I have nothing against it, but this one at least is simple, and we can a bit, I we see it's brutal, but w we understand why it's brutal and why this brutality may or no may not be bad for uh, the, uh, the rest of the uh, problem. Okay. So now we would like to apply this very simple thing in, uh, uh, in the following situation. So now we would, we would just like to have a two-level system. This is, you know, zero or one photon, so we have this two-level system. Then, in fact, there is not much choice in choosing something that brings you to equilibrium. You could impose that you have detailed balance or whatever, but uh, anyway, that's not so important. Uh, it's easy to see that essentially uh, the uh, the most general uh, matrix that will do uh, if if the gap between the two energy uh, levels is delta E, then essentially the ma Markov matrix that will do the job is just going to be minus beta delta E G G e to the minus beta delta E and one minus G. And G is anywhere between zero and the minimum of one and E beta delta E. So this is the most general matri Markov matrix, which upon iteration becomes a projector, uh, becomes, I'm sorry, not a projector, but becomes, uh, yes, pro well, yes, projects onto uh, a vector whose components are just the, what they have to do to, to be uh, the uh, equilibrium. So the claim is that if I take this as a, a matrix M, then whatever I start with, whatever Q, which is equal to Q1, Q2, I start with, then M to the N applied to Q, when n goes to infinity, is simply the ratio. ratio uh, uh, okay, so I should uh, maybe I, I will may, maybe I will make a sign mistake. So uh, you will correct me, but it's going to be one uh, e to the uh, well. Let's say one e to the uh, minus beta delta e normalized by one divided by one plus e to the minus beta delta e. And what you have to do if, is to check that I'm not mistaken, and it, it may be that this should be a plus. I'm not sure. Okay. So this is the property of this matrix, that whatever I start with, what, whatever probability distribution I start with, in the long run, I converge towards thermal equilibrium. Okay. So then in that case, there is not much to... Uh, to, to for this experiment, there is not much... Uh, uh, Ambiguity, we just have to choose G in the right way. Okay, so this is this is part so this is this is thermal in this accounts for thermal uh, equilibration. Now we want to make our measurements on the Rydberg atoms. And so uh, what we need are diagonal matrices. We decide that wh what we do is uh, in the ba we, we make uh, measurements in this basis. So we make measurements for pointer states. which are 
eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian. This is a choice. I mean, you could also do measurements uh, with respect to pointer states which are not the eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian, and then things would be quite different, in fact. And, in, in the, and the interpretation is very unclear. But uh, you, can do the, you can do the algebra. You can do it for yourself. I mean, it takes one page of computation. It's a bit more complicated, but you just imagine that you have eigenstates for the Hamiltonian, but then do you make your measure measurements uh, in another basis. But here we keep the same basis, and basically we ju we'll just take two matrices A and let's say, let's call them A and uh, A prime, and A will just be, let's say, uh, cos theta 0, 0 sine theta, and B will just be sine theta 0, 0 cos theta. And so this, this, this accounts. So you can check, so these are diagonal, so it's really related to non-demolition measurements, and you can check that A dag A plus B dag B is equal to uh, the identity. Uh, if you remember some trigonometry, that shouldn't be too difficult. So this accounts for uh, measurements, non-degenerate quantum non-demolition measurements. So now all we have to do is just to, uh, in one time step, we apply once the matrix M, then we apply this with a certain probability, this with another probability, and we go on. Okay, just as we did the other day. Okay, and this is something which is quite hard to uh, study analytically, but there is one limit in which you can do analytic computations, and which is the continuous time limit. analytically <laughs> analytic why or well, this is not correct let's say it looks like this okay I want okay and so I would I, I we won't do that because it's a bit technical I will just show you pictures but this can be studied analytically and the only question is what is the continuous time limit and if you think about the, what I showed you yesterday, you will easily convince yourself that if I take, so what is the continuous time limit? Well, you imagine that the time step is epsilon, and then what do you do? You will take that, you will decide that cos theta is something like square root of two, one over square root of two plus, uh, what's, it, what's the name I've given to it in the notes? I'm sorry, it's for the cosine squared, but it does okay, whatever, it's one half plus let's say h epsilon to the one half. You remember there was an epsilon to the one half when we got the Lindblad equation yesterday, and this is due to the measurements. However, for the part which is the thermal uh, 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 interaction, in fact, this continuous time limit will be just to take that g should be equal, it should be of order epsilon, and so what is, uh, I don't know if I took, well, it's of order epsilon and I, well, we don't need the notation. It's of order epsilon. I don't care. As, as usual, I don't find anything. In, okay, here we go. I decided that G should be some uh, lambda 
times epsilon. Okay, and the continuous limit is let to, and this is so we let epsilon go to zero, and we keep I'm sorry h and g fixed. Okay. This is the continuous time limit, and you can convince yourself that this is going to work. You just look at the equations, and that's an easy exercise. Now, what happens? Imagine that you take h to be really equal to uh, h is extremely small. Let's say, imagine it's it's small h. Remember, well, okay, you you just have to. Uh, so j is going to be. I'm sorry. This is lambda. Lambda is uh, an inverse of a time, and h is the square root of an inverse of a time. Okay. So imagine now that h is small. This means, in fact, if I take h small, a and b are very close to the identity, proportional to the identity, and essentially this means that I, I won't measure anything. I mean, the probes do not interact enough with the cavity. Nothing happens. And if you look at pictures of the time evolution, what are you going to see? You're going to see something like... Uh, what you see here on the screen, that you start from a certain state, and uh, here is, I guess, I'm representing just Q1, or maybe Q2, Q2, that's not very important, and you see, because I'm, let's, in this case, I'm not measuring at all, so what happens is that what I see when I look at the evolution of rho is that, in fact, it converges gently, exponentially, as you expect, towards thermal equilibrium. That's the only thing you see. Now imagine that you measure a little bit, so it means h becomes a bit larger, and what happens? Well, you see, this is a, a very uh, uh, well clear that still you have some kind of average. Well, I, I could have taken the noise, a little, the measurements a little bit less strong, but here you see you start from here, and then what you do is you oscillate around the limiting behavior, and. You have to think a little bit about it, and I, in fact, personally, I don't have totally clear ideas. I mean, you see fluctuations around the uh, uh, thermal equilibrium, but these fluctuations are not, well, th the randomness in these fluctuations is due to the measurement. It's not due to, well, it's, I'm, I'm sorry, it's unclear whether you should attribute these fluctuations to fluctuations in the thermal environment or to fluctuations in the probe measurements. That's not so easy to decide. Uh, if you think about quantum mechanics, maybe it's even a question that doesn't make sense. I mean, that's, uh, that's unclear. Okay, and then you go on a little bit, and you do it a little bit stronger, and what do you see? Well, this is what happens. So we, wh what we are doing is still just iterate our basic random equations, but now we have keep kept lambda fixed, and we let h get larger and larger. And you go on, and you go on, and in the, in the, if, you, if you measure sufficiently rapidly, this is, is exactly, uh, this is what the kind of uh, thing you find. And uh, contrary to what you might believe, the starting point of the simulation is not up there, it's somewhere here, but very quickly you go there, and then tack, you, you, so you see, Indeed, these equations, they contain in themselves the fact that, indeed, when you observe the system, and you observe it uh, sufficiently uh, 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 many times per, per, per second, well, you find either zero or one object in the, in the uh, cavity, and you see large fluctuations, but essentially, all the time, either you, are, you see zero obje one object, or you see zero, or you see one, or you see zero, and you see jumps from one situation to the other. So this is predicted by the equations, which is quite nice because it's, well, it, it doesn't, if you look at the equations the way they are, it's not so obvious, but that's what happens. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, so this seems to give a, a fairly satisfactory uh, model for uh, the equations we uh, wanted to, for the system we wanted to describe. Okay. So this is this is one thing, uh, which is uh, essentially the simplest example of what you can uh, uh, do. Uh, y you just have two levels in the cavity. The probes also have only two levels, so everything takes place in a two-dimensional Hilbert space, and at each time you have only two possibilities for randomness. Either you find uh, the uh, the uh, Rydberg atom in one of its states or in another. So uh, you, you can really analyze everything up to the end, uh, and in the continuous time limit, you get uh, 
stochastic differential equations that can be analyzed uh, in in a closed way. Okay, so that's uh, that's easy. I would like to show you another example, which is a bit more difficult, but still manageable analytically, and uh, which uh, is the following. We are still going to look at a two-dimensional system, but this time we are going to look at the quantum dot. So what are we going to do? We are going to s do something very, very simple. We are, we are going to imagine that we have just two quantum dots, and there is one electron one electron that can hop, may hop from one, from a dot, from dot left to dot right, and vice versa. So here is left, here is right, okay. So this is, and this is, you see, this uh, to start with, without observation, measurement, whatever you like to call it, you just see rabi, you see rabi oscillations. Okay. Which means that basically, uh, if you take uh, well, if you look at the probability to see the electron on one side, it will just be a periodic function of time. And uh, well, this is I guess you know that uh, at least as well as I know. Now, what what about what happens with observations? Well, without observation, in fact, the evolution is unitary, and you have a little unitary map for a, a unit time step, which let's, let me say is cos alpha, sine alpha, minus sine alpha, cos alpha. So this is a little unitary uh, map. Hmm? And with observations, well, why not take the same operators as before? So basically, uh, if I would, uh, would write down everything in full, I guess what I would get is the following. I have to go back to lecture one to find the right formula. Here we are, okay. Then you would find that, in fact, you have, because you see, here you have unitary evolution, so there is only one operator in the game. There is not a bunch like there would be for thermal equilibration. And so you just have two, you just play the game that we played before. So we call, okay, we shall call, let's say, A tilde is just going to be A times U, and B tilde is just going to be. Uh, P times U, and this will say, okay, this will mean that, okay, I do my, I do one time step of evolution and then I measure. And so you can compute the, uh, the, this product, it's easy to compute, and then you can iterate. Rho n plus one is equal to uh, A rho n, A tilde rho n. A tilde dag divided by trace with probability and A til B tilde rho n B tilde dag divided by trace with probability trace. Okay, so it's just, you just have to, so unitary evolution 
and we observe with these two guys, and that's the effect that you can iterate. And this problem is more interesting and also more difficult than the previous one for a simple reason. It is that, you see, we are making our non-demolition measurement in a basis which is not the basis of eigenstates of H, so of U. So they, U is not diagonal in the non-measurement, uh, in the, so, remark, U non-diagonal in the quantum non-demolition measurement pointer state basis. Okay, so then you can have a certain number of surprises, in fact. And uh, the first surprise is that we are going to... You, okay, so we would like again to tame a continuous time limit, and we do the same here. Okay. And now uh, the question is, what should we do? What, so this is the one we take, and what about alpha? And there is one way to understand that, in fact, uh, uh, alpha, alpha has uh, uh, maybe slightly unexpected scaling. I, the, the naive thing you, you could say is, okay, for one unit of evo time of evolution, alpha should be of order. I, I mean, imagine, imagine that you want to take the continuum limit of this equation alone. Well, this, trivial, this is trivial. It, would, it, it should be close to the identity with a correction of order alpha of order epsilon if this is u of epsilon. And so this means that alpha should be of order epsilon. This is the naive scaling, naive scaling alpha of order. Which works. Obvious. Obviously the correct one. Without measurement. is wrong when measurements take place. And this is related to the, Zeno, the quantum Zeno effect. This leads us to the so-called quantum Zeno effect. So, in the audience, uh, is there anyone who heard about the quantum Zeno effect at some point? Okay, a few of you. Okay, fine. Okay, so I will, wh what I will say is quite simple about the quantum Zeno effect, but uh, it's okay. So, just to remind you, uh, the Zen Zeno was a philosopher in Greece, in the old Greece, and he had this idea, that he had two arguments to show that motion is impossible. And um, the first one was that, you know, you have a Achilles that tries to catch a tortoise. And the idea is the following, that let's imagine you look at uh, uh, the, the, the tortoise starts here. And you say, but OK, but now when Achilles reaches the point where the tortoise was initially, the tortoise is somewhere else. And when it reaches where it wa she was at that time, then she's again somewhere else and so on. And so every time he arrives where she was the step before, she's gone. So he will never catch her, the tortoise. So that was one argument. And there was another argument, which is that the um, arrow never reaches the target, and which is that before you reach the target, you have to reach one half of the distance of the target, and then you have to reach uh, 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 three quarters and all that, and this makes an infinite number of uh, things, so you, cannot, uh, you never reach the target. And he used it as an argument, which is quite interesting, because he was, he was uh, uh, somehow, well, the, he took this, in fact, as an argument for quantization because he said this means that time cannot flow as a continuous quantity, space cannot be a continuous object, so this is meaningless. And so he, in fact, uh, Zeno, he, he quantized the world completely, time, space, and all that with his two arguments. That, well, of course, now we understand that he somehow misunderstood convergence series. But on the other hand, if you think a little bit about it, 
uh, he may be right in the end. I mean, mathematically, you can imagine that the world is continuous and it's very useful. We can write down differential equations and all that. But if you look at the universe at the Planck scale, for instance, well, is it continuous? Is it discrete? Is it, uh, you know, you, you uh, it's pretty clear that you could mimic uh, all we know in physics today on uh, uh, a quantum or classical computer, a Turing machine or whatever, a finite number of uh, things and uh, blah, blah, blah. And uh, uh, for as far as we know, there is no reason to assume that time is continuous and space is continuous. But the argument he gave is not correct. But anyway, so this is the uh, classical Zeno effect. And the quantum Zeno effect is a little bit uh, different. And what it's saying is the message is that uh, when measurements are done too rapidly on a system, on a system with Hamiltonian evolution, the system freezes. And the basic reason for that, I mean, you can, you can, well, this is, this is what happens also in our complicated framework of non-demolition measurement and all that. But I would like to spend just five minutes to explain it uh, in, a, uh, in a very, very simple case. In fact, we are just going to t t keep the same uh, Rabi oscillations and so keep, so Zeno effect. We are going to keep the same, uh, uh, essentially the same setting. So where is this little explanation of Zeno? This is really elementary. So imagine the following. So you imagine that, imagine that rho at time n, let me call it rho, is a pure state. So rho, I can write rho is equal to some, uh, I don't know, phi phi if I want. And it evolves for time delta. And this means that u is e to the minus i delta h, okay? So I let it evolve d doing this. So what do I see? In fact, well, uh, very simple thing. I will just then rho at time n plus one, rho prime, which is equal to rho n plus one. It's just going to be u rho u dag, okay? And then you just have to, uh, do a very simple thing. You compute the overlap between rho prime and rho n rho. So the overlap, what is the overlap? It's just, uh, wh wh how should I, it's just, tr so the overlap between rho and rho prime is just trace of rho rho prime, okay? And it's a very easy computation. I mean, you take this formula and all that, and what do you find? You will find that the overlap, so trace rho rho prime, is going to be one minus delta squared. And if I'm correct, maybe I missed a factor one half. Didn't I? No, it, I think it's correct. Minus delta squared. And what do I find? I find phi h phi, I'm sorry, h square phi minus phi h phi squared. So let, uh, a fair name for this would be to call it the quantum variance. Okay. And the important thing here is just this Tel squared here. So this means that the overlap 
is of order 1 minus delta squared, not of order 1 minus delta. If you think about what happens in the thermal case, you do the same computation when the evolution of rho would be thermal, then you would see that the overlap wouldn't be uh, like that. I mean, it would be of order delta. Here it's of order delta squared, which means that if I make a measurement after time delta, the probability to, to go back to the initial state is essentially one. It, it, you, don't, you, don't, you cannot fight against, uh, th this is too small, okay? So this is exactly the Zeno effect. It's that this is not, this is not of order delta. So if you measure at every delta step, you f the system gets freezed. Okay, so this is the Zeno effect, and what I uh, claim is that if you think a little bit about it, uh, what, 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 what does it mean in our system? I will just conclude with that and then we will have the break. Um, In fact, in our system, so um, what did I, I took? Yeah, okay, so I'm sorry. Um, so this, the, well, this, this, the, this statement is probably, uh, probably not very well formulated, but imagine we take alpha is of times omega is omega times epsilon, okay, um, then this means the Hamiltonian in fact is something like uh, omega sigma z in our uh, case, or sigma y, sigma y, okay, h is this guy, and then what we should take, okay, and then we should study Okay, so now this is, this is it, and now how, so here delta was the time it took us to make a measurement. So if you do the, the, the little scaling analysis, you will see that typically the time it takes to make a measurement in this situation, the measurement time order. H minus two, that's the time it takes. And so if you, if you think that this is of order delta, you will see that in fact the right scaling now, which what we should try to study if you want, if you want to find something interesting is just to state that omega is of order um, H times uh, another parameter where, what can I take for it? H gamma. And then we should fix, so and, st and, and study what happens when H varies at fixed gamma. And this ensures that in fact, the time, this is a way to have a fixed time scale in the system and the fixed time came gamma minus two, I guess, is the time scale of the, if the is the time scale. to describe Hamiltonian evolution when Q and D measurements take place. So maybe I've been a little bit unclear, but you should go back through the arguments uh, this, okay, this statement here, I'm not very happy with it at the moment. I, I do indeed take alpha of order omega epsilon, but uh, the, the point is that now, if you want to study, make parameters vary, but keep a finite time scale in the system, the same for all the experiments, then what you should do is to scale also 
uh, omega with gamma. You, if you want to let h vary, you should scale omega with h and keep gamma fixed, and then gamma is the real time scale in the system. Okay, that's the statement. Okay, I think we should make a break, and then I will show a few more pictures, and we will go to quantum noises. Any questions? Let's go. Read that the right thing to do if you want to keep a fixed time scale in the system is to scale also the frequency, the Rabi frequency, uh, proportional to uh, the uh, square root of the well to the strength of the measurement. Let's say then we can start to do numerical simulations and see what happens when h is very small and then when h gets large. If I wouldn't do this rescaling, when h goes large and I keep omega fixed, I would just see that the system freezes in one state. And if I do this scaling, as you will see, there is really a new t the, the time scale is really gamma and you will see it in the uh, simulations. So here are Rabi oscillations. In blue, you see, okay, so uh, this uh, deserves some comment. So in blue, I guess, but I will check on the next one, in blue is just the um, uh, a, a diagonal component of the density matrix, and in red is just the modulus of the non-diagonal component of the density matrix, okay? So blue, diagonal component, one of the diagonal component, and, and uh, red, uh, the of diagonal component of the density matrix and you see in this simulation the starting point is such that we are not in a pure state so even w as time goes by you do never reach minus one or one you see and now you start to measure and in fact it's a feature of these equations that even if you start with something which is not a pure state after a while you converge exponentially fast to a pure state so you start to measure and you see that there are measurements, so uh, I'm still unable to say to be sure of whether it's the blue or the red, which is the diagonal. I, I guess it's the blue. And you see, so now you see at some t at certain times the uh, diagonal component is exactly equal to one, and then this one is equal to zero, and at other times this one is equal to one, and then this one is equal to zero. So you see pure states that th so. This operation has a tendency to purify the system. Okay, but you come start to see oscillations, and you go on, and this is what you see. So it means I'm just measuring more and more often, and at the same time scaling the Rabi oscillations to keep gamma fixed. And you see indeed that still uh, things still continue to happen, and you continue going on. And then now I can say I. I I say it, it's the blue that is the diagonal component and it's the red that is the off-diagonal. I can see it in this picture, don't ask me why. And in fact, if you go a little bit uh, faster, in fact, uh, in the measurement, so H is becomes larger, this is what you see. You see that the system essentially hops randomly from plus one to minus one. And you see strong fluctuations in the off-diagonal component, but it's nevertheless very often close to it's it's close to these oscillations are around zero, and the diagonal component it oscillates around minus one and one, okay, and okay. and this is another picture, and I guess this is over. Yes, okay, okay. So now I can just so and if you think about it, if you just look at the blue curves and you compare with what happened in the thermal case, well. It's, es it's essentially the same kind, you see. The blue curves in the thermal case or in the uh, Hamiltonian case, well, the blue curves, they are just the same. And indeed, so I would just like to, in two minutes, to uh, tell you what is the... Uh, wha what are the things we understand about these systems? So first of all, that okay. So now the the point. Okay. So what do, what do we understand about these systems? It's in fact the large H limit, taking into account zeno freezing when necessary.
Okay. Well then, so the point of states, well, when h goes to infinity in this limit, the diagonal part of the density matrix the density matrix becomes a Markov process on the pointer states. What does this mean in, uh, in in standard language? Well, indeed, you spend some time in the in the one state here, then you jump to the zero state, you spend some time there, you jump to the one state, spend some time, jump, etc. What I'm saying is that you spend all of your time essentially close to one or minus one. This would this would hold for n-level systems, uh, whatever complicated, whatever. I mean, so you spend all your time close to the pointer states, but from time to time you jump from one pointer state to the other. And the moral of this is that what you see is really uh, what, well, w what was expected by the fathers of uh, quantum uh, 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 theory, which is to see that you have Poisson statistics and all that. So indeed, you just jump from one pointer state to the other with waiting times which are described by a Markov process and all that. Okay, so, but a finite state. I mean, instead of having something that really lives in the space of all density matrices, really things get concentrated just on the few pointer states and you jump between pointer states. And you can even compute analytically from the parameters of the model, you can compute analytically what are the jump rates. For instance, in this very simple case of Hamiltonian uh, 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 well, Rabi oscillations and non-demolition measurements. In fact, the right time scale is gamma, and in fact, the time you have to wait until uh, you go from plus one to minus one or to minus one plus one is the same, and is uh, dictated by just uh, it's it's just gamma minus two. In fact, so really, uh, gamma is the the right time scale in the system. In the thermal case, for instance it's easy to see that the jumping times that you compute are exactly what is needed to have ergodicity. By this, I mean that, uh, you see, uh, this, was, this, was, this uh, was made at the temperature which was finite, so there is, there is not the same probability to be in state one and in state two. That's exactly what happens uh, if I look at this. You see the, there is a higher probability to be up th than to be down, uh, uh, slightly higher. And indeed, you can show that the transition rates are exactly what you would expect, so that it ensures that in the continuous limit, I'm sorry, the, the time you spend here, if you wait for a very long time and you measure the time spent upstairs and you measure the time spent downstairs, it's exactly what it has to be for ergodicity. Okay, so transition rates are explicitly computable. And there is one more thing, okay, so you, you, so this is well understood, but you see there is also something which is quite uh, funny, it's that indeed you can really picture something you would say that you have this like that, but nevertheless you see rather strong fluctuations, and this in fact is not a numerical artifact, it is true that there are strong fluctuations, and in fact the fluctuations are described by Poisson processes, so I will not uh, elaborate much on that, but the fluctuations, on top of the, Markov pro of, the, on, of the Markov process, there are Poisson And they are described by a Poisson process, which is in universal, in fact.
and scale invariant. And to see the scale invariance, of course, as, as you can see, the, 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 values, the possible values of Q are bounded. I mean, they are between minus 1 and 1. So the fluctuations, the large fluctuations, they cannot be scale invariant. However, the small ones, which take place nearby this or there, they are scale invariant, which means that if you look at very small uh, jumps here, they are described by a very simple distribution. Basically, uh, the measure is proportional to 1 if... The, the fluctuations here is of order, if, he, if the distance to the, the, the ground is, is of order epsilon, then the, the, the number of points is of order epsilon uh, to the minus two. So many, many points there. Okay. So this ends the description. Okay. So these things uh, I uh, um, think are uh, new. And in fact, it would be good to have them tested in experiments. And I would just like to end by saying that, you know, the pictures I showed you of the experiment at the École Normale, you see also that there are many things like that. They are really different nature than the uh, spikes that are visible on these things. And at the moment, the experiments really do not have enough resolution to observe these little things and let alone uh, test the scale invariance, but it's a prediction. There is, in fact, something that was totally unexpected for me, which is a very, very strong universality in these systems, that as soon as you measure uh, often, uh, so you have many, many probes uh, per second that go uh, in the system, well, what you get in the end is uh, essentially depends on very, very little on the details of the system you're looking at. The details of the system just tell are used to compute explicitly some transition rates, and once these transition rates are uh, done, uh, all the rest is totally universal. Okay, so uh, I can answer a few questions, and then I will say a few words about uh, quantum, qu quantum noises, which is totally independent of what I said up to now. So it's an appropriate point if you have questions. No questions, then. Let's go to quantum noises. Quantum noises. Okay, so in just, well, one line, I can give you a flavor of what is, are called quantum noises, and it's just based on the following, that I claim that if we have, if A, A DAG is a bosonic pair, so this, uh, you see, there is a creation and an annihilation operator, and it's a bosonic pair, and uh, then I take xi, and xi bar is a complex normalized centered Gaussian random variable. So how do you compute uh, well, I have a question for the audience. So, how do you compute easily expectations of functions of a, uh, let's say, how, how would you compute the expectation of uh, xi to the 8, xi bar to the 9, or something like that? What would you use as a theorem for? I'm sorry? Who said that? Yes, Vic theorem. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. And, and in fact, the content of Vick's theorem can be given in that case that the expectation of e to the alpha uh, xi bar plus alpha bar xi is just e to the alpha alpha bar. This is Vick's theorem in some sense, if you can. And how would you compute 
vacuum expectations values of AA DAG. Well, how, how would you compute it? Vix theorem, yes. I should put a vacuum somewhere here. Okay, and, and again, if you do this computation, uh, again, the vacuum expectation of E to the alpha A dag plus alpha bar A is exactly to E to the alpha alpha bar. Okay, so you see that somehow there is a way to anything you would do on the classical probability space with uh, Gaussian random variables, you can do on the Hilbert space with uh, operators, in that case, bosonic operators. Okay, so this, uh, well, y if, you, if you want to remember just one thing about quantum noises, because time is short, you can remember that, that quantum noises are just objects in, in that, the, the, the consideration that studying Hilbert spaces and the expectation values in Hilbert spaces is very analogous to considering uh, expectations in probability theory. And then, in fact, then after that you can, well, you know, there are some deep theorems that if you take the, wh what is it, the, the dual of a von Neumann algebra is, uh, if, if the von Neumann algebra is commutative, then the dual of the von Neumann algebra is the algebra of, a fun of functions on some measure space or whatever, probability space. Well, so the, you can do things which are much more subtle from, from a mathematical point of view, but to get just a, a gross picture, anything you can do with uh, Gaussian random variables uh, on the probability space, you can also do with bosonic operators on a uh, Hilbert space. So this, and then somehow, you you could say that uh, uh, quantum so it's you know you can use Gaussian random variables to build Brownian motion in just the same way you can use uh, bosonic uh, creation and annihilation operators to to con construct something that deserves the name of quantum Brownian motion and things like that and the situ the the the, uh, the 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 construction is exactly the same but it turns out that of course you can also have a look at fermionic creation and annihilation operators, and they also deserve the name of, they uh, can also be used as quantum noises. So the quantum situation is richer, in fact, than the classical situation, but uh, uh, which, some well, which is sometimes annoying and sometimes good. But essentially, uh, when, when people talk about quantum noises, it means that they have some Hilbert space, they have some state on this Hilbert space, so that they can take expectations and these, well, or average values or uh, what, whatever, and these objects are very similar to uh, expectations in the sense of probability theory. So quantum noises, they involve operators and they don't involve random variables. So that's the, the, the one, uh, the, 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 one uh, the, the very short message. So I would like to make it a little bit longer and uh, the, uh, the way it goes is, uh, an another way to say it is that, in fact, uh, quantum noises, that, that's, uh, that, that's the, the one uh, really for, it's for, for dummies. I mean, and the dummy is me, it's not you. Um, so, you see that we have found a way to transform uh, what we've done up to now. Everything has been in the realm of classical probability. You know, when we, uh, we, we, we made measurements and then According to the result of the measurement, the density matrix would evolve in, in one way or in another. And we, well, really this was, I could formulate this as just, we, we just had some kind of, of Markov process on the space of uh, uh, density matrices. That's exactly what we discussed in these lectures. So it was classical. And this is because, this is because we measured. or because we took par partial traces.
quantum noise is are when you don't me are when you don't measure. So I remind you that we had this space HS. It was tensored by HE, and HE was in fact a tensor product of a certain Hilbert space K, tensor well, 1, 2, blah, 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 infinity. And just to be mathematically rigorous, we had to choose a reference state in it. Okay, so we had HE, we had an evolution operator U of N, an evolution operator. And we had an initial density matrix. Which was row system tensor psi psi tensor blah 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 tensor psi psi tensor blah blah blah. So quantum noises, another way to state it is quantum noises is the study of a triple. Well, our big Hilbert space H, a unitary evolution operator on H, and a state rho. And you see, wh for instance, wh what you see is that due to this evolution, so you see this initial density matrix is a tensor product, but then as time goes by, you entangle it a little bit with the environment. Y y there is entanglement between the system and the environment, and somehow, you, the, the goal somehow is to analyze how rho s well, dissolve somehow in the environment. Okay, so this is the second version, baby version of quantum noises. And uh, it's just, it's just study these things and, and in the, and, uh, and UN would like to compute the power and okay so this is uh, another uh, thing you can say about quantum noises so you could say okay this is this is very boring and this is okay this this is just too trivial this is just too abstract so i will try to find something which is slightly non trivial than that is slightly less abstract than that to end up these lectures well, uh, it will be to you to judge whether it will be closer to the abstract nonsense or to the triviality i mean it's uh, and uh, the question you can ask is how to generalize classical random walks. And there is one simple way which is uh, which is not the right the right one but one way the first the first way you can think of and uh, in fact for maybe uh, reasons that are funny i don't know but i learned that way from uh, giuseppe Sardo many years ago um so you imagine that you so imagine that you have p 1 minus p 1 minus q q i don't know this is okay so this is a markov matrix And now, so, and of course, you can imagine that you, uh, why do I want to do that? I don't know. Let's, let's take it. Okay. Well, why not take it like this? It's, it's also a Markov matrix. And as you all know, um, it's, uh, uh, one of the central, uh, objects of study in random walks is to, you just have one point on a line and you let it, 
you, you flip a coin and you decide whether you go uh, left or right with a certain probability which is independent and all that. And so this is done by coin flipping. Okay. And now a slightly non-standard description of uh, a random walk is the following. It's just to take, uh, I would like to have my notations right, so let's do it. And uh, that I will take uh, something which carries an epsilon and an n. This will be an integer. Maybe I should call it s. And this will be plus or minus 1. And I just do the following that so this will be a basis uh, basis of some Hilbert space. And I will I can define something which is just T applied to epsilon and S. And I will say, okay, that's my definition. It's P. Epsilon prime S plus Epsilon prime plus 1 minus P I'm sorry 1 S plus 1 and 1 minus P minus 1 S minus 1 Okay, so I, st I start from anything and this the meaning of I start from a state S and With probability p, I, f I flip the coin, it gives 1, and then I go to s plus 1, and with probability 1 minus p, the coin gives minus 1, and then I go to s minus 1. Okay? So this is a very simple thing, and if you think about it, this is really a fa fa this represent, this, well, if you, you iterate, if you iterate t and blah 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 and, 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 and whatever you want, uh, you will find that uh, iteration of t builds random walks. So for instance, if you look at, uh, if you look at the large, uh, uh, well, you, you can, for instance, you, 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 if you do things, uh, iterate, you will find again the uh, binomial coefficients and then whatever, where everything you are used to. Okay. Now, how would you can, how would, and what is the crucial, the crucial ingredient is that this guy here is a Markov matrix. This is crucial ingredient, classical ingredient. Okay. So now I want to quantize this. Yes. Well, whether it's my, you see, you can see that it's the state just that you are, well, it, it's, let's say it's, it's the result of the previous, uh, uh, tossing and you don't care. It doesn't depend on the, no, it's, it's, you're, you're right. It doesn't depend at all. Whether it's epsilon, it's plus or minus one that has not any influence. Yes. It's, no, it's, it's the way you want it. It's just, it's, you see, this, you see, if, if you think about it here, what I do, I, if I have one, I go to S plus one. So this is just, The, the last step you made, and if you toss a new coin, you don't care about what, what was the last result. So it's, it's, it's the same. Okay. Which is exactly what this matrix is saying as well. I mean, okay. Um, okay. So now what is crucial in this game, and you, and you could have, yeah, there is a, uh, I don't have time to talk about it, but there is a generalization with every, uh, uh, every Markov chain, a uh, Markov matrix, you can generalize this. And uh, it's, it's essentially the fact that there is no epsilon dependence here is just the Markov property somehow. Okay. Um, now, how to quantize it? Well, replace. Well, this is probability conserving. And what is the prob conservation of probability related to in quantum mechanics? It's unitarity of the evolution. So now you take a unitary uh, matrix. Let's call it U. U is very famous in many, many uh, uh, fields. It's called the Adamar matrix, which is the simplest of the Adamar matrices. 
and it's used as a Hadamard gate in quantum computing. It's used in many, many places, but it's a small unitary matrix that is quite symmetric and nice, but you could take any, and then you could play exactly the same game that you would find, and you would take, now you, you would take T, Epsilon, and S, and say, okay, this is one of the square root of two times one S plus one. I'm sorry. Um, I'm doing it wrong, so I have to look at my notes. I'm sorry. This time, this time it matters. So, I'm sorry. I erase this. So, I will define T applied to 1N. And this time it matters, and it's uh, 1 over, um, let's call it, well, I call it 1, yes. So it's 1 over square root of 2, and I would find the state 1 and plus 1 plus minus 1 and minus 1. And here to get t acting on minus 1n, I would just have to look at 1 over square root of 2, um, and it's minus n pl 1 n plus 1 plus minus 1 n minus 1. Okay, so you see I'm just doing the same game as I'm doing here, and now, wh uh, well, it may, it may be that uh, I made a mistake and I should have put a p and a 1 minus p here. I'm not sure. I, I don't have it. Okay, maybe you should, you should switch these two guys. I don't know. Uh, to ensure that you don't have any epsilon dependence there. Okay, but here you see it's, these are just the Adama matrices elements. It's, it's just simple. Okay, and now what happens upon iteration? What about t to the n? And in fact, t to the n is quite a fascinating object, and I will show you just a picture. If you if you would do that for the classical case, and you would observe the repartition of uh, things, you would just find something which look like, looks like a Gaussian. In fact. And what do you do if you do that? You would have to you have to take some averages over the initial state and all that to get a nice picture. But this is the picture you get when you do you. So you you take this Adamar matrix, you make two thousand steps, and you look at where the particle is after two thousand steps, and you see that it doesn't go exactly up to 2,000, but it definitely goes much, much further than square root of 2,000, which is the one for classical uh, diffusion. And in fact, it's even worse than that. It's, it's essentially ballistic. And you know, this picture has many fascinating features. And in particular, it's not trivial at all, if I remember correctly, to compute where this thing is. So the speed at which you move, but there is a speed, it's ballistic, in fact. It's a fraction, so it's 2,000, so you see, it's a finite fraction of 2,000, but it's quite less than 2,000, and the proportionality constant is not trivial. And so these things are, ha have nice features and mathematical features, but they are really not, they show no diffusion and all that. So this is, uh, s s this thing some people call quantum random walk. But in fact, uh, we, 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 well, it's, it, it's, it's, it's not, well, it's not very uh, coherent with our intuition of what we want, would like quantum random walks to be. So then mathematicians invented something called quantum random walks. Do you think I can take five more minutes, uh, Filippo? Yes, you give me five more minutes. Okay, so I will, I will finish uh, just by presenting you this model of quantum random walks. Uh, which is uh, quite easy, uh, just to define it, and which whose study really belongs to the f uh, framework of quantum noises. It's quite easy. It's the following. So, uh, we uh, again, you could define quantum walk circles that are very complicated. I want to keep things extremely simple. So, what I have to do is take the case. When my space key k is two dimensional and if you remember correctly 
I defined at that time, it, it has nothing to do with that one. I defined, the, uh, so I had HS, and I defined oper an operator U, which was equal to uh, uh, U applied to phi tensor psi was just equal to sum over A, 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 phi tensor A. Of course, this doesn't define U uniquely, but as long as I'm concerned only, as I told you, quantum noises are about the study of this triple. Psi is part of my triple, so uh, I don't have to define U anywhere else because I, Psi is part of the density matrix, and so I won't have to define U anywhere else, but I can make it into a, uh, a unitary operator. And oh, so this was the basic definition. Now, yes? Yeah, it's T. Yes, well, it's not the same T. It's another T, if you want it. It's T quant T quantum. Well, you see, here are plus plus minus minus. Uh, square root of two. Square root of two is here. Plus plus minus plus. Okay, it's, I'm I'm just I'm just applying it to to plus and minus one. I apply T and then I just move n by plus or minus one accord. So y uh, if you forget about n, you see exactly the matrix U, and then. Depending on what you have here, you, you switch uh, n by plus or minus 1. Okay, it's just okay. So this is it. And of course, you could think that this is a bit uh, uh, useless. But now, let's do, le we do a very slight extension. We shall define the big U. And this time, I, I shall apply it to phi tensor n tensor and A is equal to plus or minus plus or minus 1 okay I, it's a is two di k is two dimensional so i have only two states a and th i call them plus or minus 1 okay and now i define a big u and what do i do it on psi <coughs> well this is ex I'm, I'm going to play exactly the same trick as that i i go i went from um, oh yes maybe it would deserve the name t in fact it's another T once again. So if this is U, this is my T. And what does it do to this complicated object? It's going to be that uh, A is plus or minus 1. So it's going to be sum over A of A A phi tensor N plus A tensor A. OK? And this is again, uh, this again can be extended to your unitary operator that I can use. And so what I claim is that now that if I look at HS tensor K tensor one infinity psi, I look at it with the operator T and with the density matrix rho S tensor psi. Psi tensor psi psi. The study of this very simple object, well, this is this is an interesting quantum noise. And exercise, which will end this uh, series of lecture, is just to uh, get some feeling, compute some iterates of t. So remember, this I, I let t act on psi, but now the next one will not act on this first copy of psi, but on the second copy, and then on the third copy, and so on. So uh, copy exactly what we've discussed in the lectures by deciding that now we are looking, I'm sorry, h. This is what I'm going to call hs now. Maybe I should call it tilde, I don't know. I put a tilde, it's larger than what it was before. And the study of this guy here. And so when you want to iterate, you just apply the rule that I gave in the lecture. This t was just to apply on the first psi, but you could also apply the next one will act on the second psi and all that. And I advise you to compute the th three iterates of t okay and 
This, in fact, is a model that leads to uh, many interesting uh, physical questions. And uh, to, uh, if there is diffusion in this model, you can do computations. And this guy deserves... So then you can concentrate by taking partial traces or whatever. You can concentrate really on the random walk part, which is concentrated there, and study what it uh, leads to. And it's an interesting model for uh, diffusion, uh, which has many interesting features. And I think it's time to stop. And I thank you for your attention. Questions? Yes? I take, I take, okay, so it, to be precise, if I remember correctly, you take an initial, you take, you take an initial state, which is cos theta phi theta. That's, that's my initial state and zero. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Cos theta uh, let's say one, uh, sorry, here is zero plus sine theta minus one zero. So, uh, you, you have, uh, uh, th this, the initial state, uh, well, yes, it's normalized. That's fine. This is the initial state. You are, you are at, you are at the position zero to start with and a, f a fraction of cos theta up and the fraction of sinus sine theta down, okay? And then you iterate and you compute the probability to be at a certain site. So the probability to, that this guy has a certain value and to get a nice picture, you average over theta and you get this. Okay, does that, does that answer your question? Well, you have do it. Do, well, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it either. It's not obvious. No, no, it's not. Oh, no, no. It's it, this is. A, I, I did it numerically. I mean, it's but it's it's easy. I mean, you, if, well, but it, it turns out that things conspire to to get uh, uh, in this. And this, the, if I remember correctly, this picture is related to the Airy function and to many complicated things. Well. I don't know if you think that the very function is complicated, but uh, this is something you can. Well, th this is something you cannot compute on a on a piece of paper. I guess it's it's hard, but it's very easy to put on the computer. And then this, you say, you know, the, all these things are positive. So this is really the modulus of the wave function after a certain number of uh, steps. Well, I guess it's z yes, it's zero at zero. I guess yes, I would say that. I I I have a small uncertainty because this is a bit old in my memory, but yes, it goes to zero. Yes, yes, really everything is leaving and moves at a certain speed. In fact, yes, every yeah. Yes, one. Wait. I would say no, I would say it does the same. I mean, if it has a probability to hop from one place to the other. No, but because I, I don't think, I, I think, I think the particle on the lattice would But th what does that mean, the same particle? You have to describe what are the rules for evolution. If the rules for evolution are, the, are that it can hop from one side to the other, it's going to diffuse just like in the continuum. 
Okay, well, I, I, I've, I've said a few wrong things since the beginning of that school, so I, I, I don't want to say one more, but I, I'm, I'm puzzled by your comment. Well, if it, well, I'm, I'm very surprised, but okay, may, okay, I, uh, some people have good days and bad days, okay. okay. Thank you again.